Hi students, welcome to HSC Biology and Module 5, Heredity. This is video number 26, and we're going to be looking at frequency data. So having left some of our study of Mendelian genetics behind, we're going to move forward now and see if we can use some of this data um, and maybe some variations in this data to start to look at populations in a little more detail. Specifically, what we want to do in this case is to um, examine some frequency data. So we're going to see if we can generate some and also to have a look at some pre-existing data and see what it means. As a consequence, there's going to be a couple of important things for you to be able to do. Firstly, describe what frequency data is. Um, how you might go about collecting some frequency data and to analyze frequency data to look for specific patterns or trends as well as some of the limitations. So we're going to get you to play with some data and use some data and I just want to introduce some of these concepts in this video. So your textbook defines population genetics as the study of how the gene pool of a population changes over time. So how does the gene pool change over time? I guess another question is why would the gene pool change over time? And we've looked at um, in our year 11 studies the fact that evolution acts on variability within the gene pool. So we need to have a range of different alleles present and the fact that those different alleles are going to code for different types of phenotypes or at least different types of proteins may actually influence which individuals uh, within the population are better fitted to any change that may occur in their environment. So this is one of the reasons why population geneticists in particular want to know about allele frequencies. That is how often particular alleles are present in a population. Now if you think about the simplest um, form of this, so a capital A or a little a, given the fact that if we have a situation uh, where there are only two alleles, so we're not talking about multiple alleles here, just two alleles, the dominant or the recessive, whether they're co-dominant or incompletely dominant doesn't matter at this stage, but just two expressions, then obviously the simplest thing for us to conclude would be in any population we would have 50% of A and 50% of B. But hang on. If A is dominant, then is that not going to change the proportion of A uh, big A and or of little a. Is it possible that a recessive condition could actually become um, numerically higher within a population than the dominant allele? Well, the answer to both of those questions is yes. Um, there can be variation away from the 50-50 and in fact it's very unlikely that we're going to see any of these alleles um, occurring at exactly 50-50 in the population. And for various reasons, there may well be a higher percentage of the uh, big A allele uh, or there may be a higher percentage of the little a allele. Either way, we can use uh, a little bit of mathematics and I probably should have given you that warning before we started uh, this particular video. There is a little bit of maths in this. In fact, it becomes a little bit more complex when we look at the Hardy-Weinberg law but I don't know how much of that you're going to have to actually apply in your HSC exam. So we'll cover it and we'll give you a look at it and a look at basically the difference between theoretical and experimental in terms of uh, probability. But that's, that's really all we're going to do. Probably the simplest mathematical um, calculation that you can do is look at the frequency of allele A. And when we look at the frequency of allele A, we're looking at the number of copies of allele A, so capital A we're talking about here, um, divided by the total number. So obviously, um, if we had a population that had 50 and there was 100 altogether, then we would have a frequency of 0 0.5, which is what we talked about above. We also talked about the fact that the population may not be exactly 50-50. Um, if it's 75-25, then obviously the population um, frequency for the capital A might be 75 on 100, which is 0.75. Hopefully you realise from these numbers that the frequencies have to be between 0, none of them at all, and 1, absolutely in every individual in the population. So our numbers will always um, sit between those. 
and hopefully too your mathematics is uh, sufficient for you to turn these uh, decimals into percentages if that is more helpful to you. So 0.5 would be 50%, 0.75 would be 75% and so on. So one of the things that it did talk about was you collecting data. Now we can analyze lots of data, but obviously in a video we can't collect it. So one of the things that I will get you to look at in class is collecting some data about a population. Now I think there's two valuable ways to do this. And the problem with this is that the, um, the best way to do this, and we'll look at examples uh, in class, uh, is with, with populations where you can see subsequent generations. And you can see whether or not a LL is increasing, decreasing in terms of its frequency or is stable through the generations. We can't really do that with humans. It's a little bit tricky, except we can uh, build a pedigree. So we can look at a pedigree for a particular trait. Um, and, it, and it's useful if you pick some of these um, phenotypes that we've got here, phenotype A or phenotype B. I haven't called them big A, little a. Because uh, one of the things we want to do is see if when we collect data, that data gives us any indication of or, or any way of determining whether or not it is um, uh, one is dominant over another. So um, family pedigrees are always useful because you can get a sense from looking at other family members. Obviously, you are related to these people, so therefore they will have some genetic similarities to you. And therefore, it's easier to track um, traits through generations where we know the individuals are related to each other. Um, you can also survey on uh, other members of your class, other members in your school, um, local community if you want to do that. Um, and those surveys can vary in size. They obviously are going to be of just individuals in a population, so there's no reason to suggest that they would be related to one another in any way. And what we can do is we can get frequency data from that for various, you know, if you could you could ask about a hitchhiker's thumb, whether the earlobes were attached, whether they could roll their tongue, um, and so on. Um, but that doesn't give us any longitudinal data. So it doesn't tell us how the population uh, frequency of alleles may be changing over time. However, if you have at least 50 individuals, and um, when we're doing um, population sampling, we need to have a, a minimum number because otherwise it gets ridiculous. We just can't make any conclusions if the sample size is too small. More is always better. Surveying is always something that's worth doing, worth thinking about in a political context. Obviously, um, if organisations are trying to get a sense of which way people will vote, the best way is to ask every individual. That's also very expensive, and that's why we only do it when, they, when we're actually getting them to vote. Um, so we can't ask everyone, so we ask a small sample population, but we need to think about our sample size in terms of how big is it, where are we taking it from? Are we taking it from an area where we would expect most people to either vote um, Labor or Coalition? Uh, or are we taking a representative sample that may give us more accurate picture of, you know, if, if people are swing voting, which party or parties um, are they're finding in favour at the moment? And of course, um, in Australia, we've got a few other parties that have just started to rise a little bit, particularly the Greens. So... What we can do with that is we can work out exactly what size of sample we want from that sample size. We can start to do some analysis, such as do we know what type of inheritance? Are we looking at autosomal inheritance? Are we looking at something that's actually more common in males and maybe sex-linked? Are we looking at um, different combinations of things that maybe have an intermediate that we haven't considered? Uh, and so therefore they may be examples of co-dominance or incomplete dominance. And of course, one of, the big uh, one of the big points for population genetics is how do we know if the allele frequencies are changing? And a single point in time, a survey, even a large survey with lots of individuals at a single point in time may give us frequency data, but it won't tell us anything about how the frequency of those alleles is changing. And so that brings us to the Hardy-Weinberg law. Now, this is something that is probably worth knowing about. Um, how deep you want to go into the Hardy-Weinberg law is probably up to you. Um, this is a definition that comes from the BioLibra site. Um, I actually find this a really good resource, uh, so I would 
uh, encourage you to have a look at it if you haven't already. Um, the definition from the Hardy Weinberg of the Hardy Weinberg law from the BioLibra site is so long as certain conditions are met, gene frequencies and genotype ratios in a randomly breeding population remain constant from generation to generation. Now, the simplest uh, way to think about that is um, that if we have a dominant big A and a recessive little a, then we would expect in a lot of uh, random experiments, obviously we're not here in any way trying to suggest that certain individuals will breed with certain other individuals, but we allow populations to do what they do. We look at the gene frequencies and we see what happens. We find that a lot of the recessive alleles are being masked by the dominant one, not expressed because they're in combination with the dominant one. Will they eventually disappear? Well, Hardy-Weinberg law says, no, they won't. They're reasonably stable. Even if the numbers drop um, so that the frequencies are very, very low, they won't go to zero. Now, there are some assumptions that are made there. Um, and so, like many laws, Hardy-Weinberg has its um, limitations, but we might look at them in class later on. How do we apply this? This is what I think is interesting about the Hardy-Weinberg law because it tries to get a sense of the difference between the theoretical laws that we learned from Mendel in those um, pea plant experiments when we're doing particularly our monohybrid crosses and the actual experimental ratio. So the things that really happen. And of course, even when Mendel was doing his experiments, he didn't find um, those phenotypic ratios of three to one perfectly. They were close, they were consistent, and therefore his explanation of those ratios um, it was substantially correct. We know that there are a couple of variations to that, things like um, the assumption of independent assortment, which doesn't always happen. Some genes are linked and they're not assorted independently. But given the 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 main thrust of what it was that Mendel was looking at, he was substantially correct, and that's why his work has, has stood up to this time. But experimentally and in reality, the numbers aren't always so nice in terms of proportions. So here um, in the first example is the theoretical. Theoretical says that within any population, you might have a roughly 50-50 split of um, big A alleles and little a alleles. And so when you do your genetic crosses, you have um, just the same way that we've done our mathematics before, bringing these across and down. But in the past, all we've done is look at a big A and a big A or a big A and a little a. Now, if we think about the frequency, we can add these frequencies in and work out exactly what the proportions are. And hopefully you notice that theoretically this works out to be exactly what we thought it would be, which is uh, 0.25 uh, big A big A to 0.25 plus 0.25, which is 0.5 big A little a, and 0.25 little a little a. And so obviously that's going to come down to a one to two to one ratio, which is going to give us our, uh, for genotype, which is going to give us our three to one ratio as Mendel predicted. But if the population is not exactly 50-50, if when we're working through these things, there's various factors, which may mean that um, when the gametes are made, so remember that the the 50-50 split is based on every one of those cells um, dividing to put one of those alleles into each of the gametes. All of the gametes, we're assuming, will be viable, and therefore all of them will have the chance of uh, uniting through fertilization with another gamete in order to produce a new individual. Now, there's some reasons why that may not be the case. And even if we just change the ratio from 50-50 to 60-40, so we've now said 60% are capital A and 40% are little a. So we haven't changed it a lot, we've just changed it a little bit. Now you can see when we bring these down, we get all four of our um, genotypes that we saw before, two of which are the same as we saw before, but now the proportions in the population are slightly different. So when I do 0 0.6 times 0 0.6, I get 0 0.36. 0 0.6 times 0 0.4 is 
and that's the same for both of our big A, little a's, and then our 0.4 times 0.4 is 0.16. Notice again, this time we've got a 0.36 big A, big A, to 2.4 and 2.4 is 0.48, so that's kind of close to what it was before, big A, little a, to 0.16 little a, little a. And that's not going to reduce to numbers very easily. Um, we can call it 18 to 24 to 8. Um, but nevertheless, you can see that the frequencies change. So this is the experimental um, result, and you can see that there's been a little bit of a change. Now, there's one additional mathematical com uh, complication, if you like, which I don't think is too complicated. But what we've basically looked at is if... We call P the proportion of um, one allele, let's call it capital A, and we add Q, which is the proportion of the other allele. Then obviously when we add these together, they must be equal to one. That is, there must be a, um, a whatever isn't capital A in the population must be little a. So it's looking at the frequency of these, different two, these two different alleles. Now, mathematically, if I square one side and I square the other side, then I end up with the same expression. Um, or at least I, I haven't done anything to one side, I haven't done to the other side. Now, if you can expand a square, you would know that P plus Q all squared is equal to P squared plus Q squared plus 2PQ. Now, that's also got to be equal to 1. And interestingly enough, those frequencies are the ones that actually appear in our uh, revised Punnett square. What that, what that means quite nicely is if we have a frequency of Q squared, and we know what Q squared is going to be because that's going to be the individuals that are expressing the recessive phenotype, the only ones that are expressing the recessive phenotype of those homozygous recessive, then that means we can actually work backwards in order to get ourselves to, from this equation, which I'll call 1, the frequency of P, and therefore from P we can also work out exactly what the proportion is between our homozygous dominant and our heterozygous dominant. And remember when we were looking at, pun at pedigrees, when the dominant trait was expressed, we couldn't always work out whether it was homozygous or heterozygous from those pedigrees. Here, in this um, application of Hardy-Weinberg, we get a chance to have a look at exactly what those uh, proportions are like. It still doesn't tell us anything about an individual, but it gives us a bit more of an idea about the uh, frequencies of alleles in a population. That's a little bit complex. Um, hope you've stayed with it, and obviously we'll do one or two examples in class. Thanks for watching.